Welcome to Critical Choices. This podcast is from the Ethics Committee of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine, and we're going to be talking about topics related to medical ethics, emergency medicine, and making critical choices in time-limited circumstances. I'm Melissa Myers. I'll be your host. I'm an associate professor of emergency medicine, and I'd like to start with a disclaimer that the opinions and assertions expressed herein are mine and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Department of Defense or any other institutions. With me today, I have Dr. David Soffer. Um, Would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hey, Melissa. Hi, everyone. My name is David Soffer. I'm a neonatologist uh, here in Nebraska at uh, Nebraska Children's Hospital and the University of Nebraska uh, Medical Center. All right. David and I are going to be talking about non-beneficial care, which is a term that I learned in preparation for this podcast. I would have called it futile care last week. And I do want to just briefly explain what I mean by that. So in emergency medicine, we talk a lot about end-of-life care and whether or not our interventions are truly benefiting the patient and whether or not we are performing futile care. There's been a shift in the nomenclature when we're talking about this care at the end of life from futile care, which can have some negative connotations associated with it, to non-beneficial care, which better reflects our true concern, which is, are we giving care to the patient that does not benefit them at all? Having said that, David, I'd like to start by asking you to define what and would you consider to be non-beneficial care? Yeah, I everything you just said, I, I agree with that definition. I really refrain of using the word futile, especially when I talk to parents. There are a lot of literature about that word and how there's not a lot of juice in it in the ethics world. So Yeah, I use unbeneficial, but I also use, sometimes I also say inappropriate intervention as well. And to be completely honest, when it comes to inappropriate treatment, it's quite rare in my specialty. For example, I can think of only a few cases where I will never, I will never offer any kind of life-sustaining intervention. For example, it would be a newborn who is non-viable, like uh, a baby who is born at the 20 weeks gestation. And it's just not feasible sometimes for me, have the equipment, uh, the baby doesn't have the developed ana- anatomy for me to intubate this baby, for example. So that would be for me in our circle would be futile, but also inappropriate to do this kind of uh, interventions. Okay, yeah, and that's so far outside the, <laughs> the general practice of me as an emergency physician. Yeah. So when you say in a, inappropriate, you're really talking about care that you think isn't going to change the course of the patient's disease at all. Is that yes. roughly correct? That, and my concern is that obviously will cause more harm than benefit to the patient. In preparing for this podcast, I read an article on, they called it futile care. So I'm going to call it that just when referencing this article And they talked about non-beneficial care as being a class of therapies that physicians could withhold regardless of patient and family wishes. And that, I think, speaks to what you're talking about and is interesting to us as emergency physicians because so often we don't know the patient or family wishes in end-of-life care and so feel that we need to proceed with very invasive things like intubation or CPR, because we are trying to do our best with the concern that we may be providing non-beneficial care, which is where the idea for this podcast came from. Yeah, Melissa, I don't envy you, honestly. I rarely have this kind of scenario, so I can't even imagine what you guys, you and the other emergency docs are facing with. It's sometimes, I honestly admire that, that you need to make those decisions so rapidly and also live with those decisions. So it does get interesting sometimes. Yeah. One of the things that, though that I wanted to talk to you about, because we've talked, Dr. Sofa and I are both in, in a master's degree in bioethics, and you do get the chance to talk to families. And I think that we could probably learn something from that. And I wanted to ask you about it. How do you approach conversations with families about care that you think is inappropriate or non-beneficial? It depends on the luxury of time that I have at that specific case, just unlike, like I said before, you might not have the luxury of time that I have in the ER, but for me, sometimes I have this, I have a parent who is in about to imminently deliver a 
peri viable baby and at 22, 23 weeks where things are vague in terms of how much are we willing to do and uh, pursue life inter- uh, life sustaining interventions while mom is at delivery in pain she is super stressed dad is about to pass out and there's and we need to make some sort of a decision so the time could be definitely like a, a factor and each parent honestly at the moment of time will say they want to pursue any type of life preserving interventions but when i do have more time it's a very long process it's i my first step is to understand the parents perspectives like their story where are they coming from what do they know about their child's disease, how much do they know? And I try to detect gaps in knowledge during that time to make sure they're well informed about their child's condition. That would be my first step. And based on what they tell me, the next step would be to express my concerns about their certain wishes, about a certain intervention they want us to do, or even a study that they want us to do. One of the concepts that gets talked about sometimes by emergency physicians is in end-of-life care. Generally, we're doing end-of-life care at the very opposite end of the age range. But there's a similar, there's something similar there in that families will often, when death is coming, revoke hospice and ask you to do everything. Because it's very, it's a terrifying moment, I think, for everyone. And there can sometimes have this feeling of being co-opted right? We want to respect the patient and family autonomy, but at the same time, there's this sense of, I am perhaps doing something that feels unethical. I don't think that this procedure is going to benefit the patient. How do you draw the line there between respecting the autonomy, performing procedures in line with the patient's wishes, and then drawing a line when you're like, no, this is no longer at all beneficial? Yeah. So thankfully, it's a little bit different in pediatric medicine because you just said respecting the family autonomy, but there's our, as our greatest of duty is to our patients' benefits. And if I do see clear cut requests or wishes that I know will cause harm to the patient, and it's not going to give any resolution to the underlying condition to that patient has, it's either I will find the middle ground where I have a discussion with the parents, you want this to be done, but these are my concerns about that. How about we do instead of A and instead of what I think should be, let's find a mix of it, find a middle ground and do C and see if we see any beneficial outcome out of it. And if so, we can move towards your wishes and doing maybe something more aggressive or moving on for the next procedure that might benefit that patient. So it's very individual, but the extreme cases, I would be very paternalistic. And I said, we are not doing, we're not going to do that. I've done that. I can count on one hand, but yeah, that happened. So that's that actually answers what I had up next was, what do you do when the parents are requesting a procedure that you feel is harmful? And it sounds like you're saying you feel ethically obligated to step in and protect the patient from an inappropriate or painful procedure with minimal or no benefit. If I do have a lot of time, I would also consult the ethics committee. Without going into case details, can you give an example of a procedure which you might decline to perform? I don't do the terrifying tiny little people very often, so I don't necessarily have a good idea of what kind of procedures might come up for them. Yeah. For example, I'm just trying to think clear. The problem in my field is that it's such a rapidly developing field that what we once thought was one condition was incompatible with life people really challenge certain conditions, those conditions and challenge that self-fulfilling prophecy that by doing something and then we long and behold, they're not dead, they're alive. And they actually, they survive for 
a month, a year, a few years. For example, trisomy 18, trisomy 13 newborns. I don't know when, Dr. Myers, when you were a medical student, I, when I was taught about trisomy 18, 13, or also during residency, we would not offer anything. We would just offer palliative care for those infants because we considered them to be incompatible with life. Nowadays, that's not the standard of care. And we do offer heart surgeries, tracheostomies, G-tubes. That paradigm had shifted. And same goes for neonatal dialysis. We did not used to do them during my fellowship, never. I can't even remember of one occasion when I had the newborn who I hooked him up to a dialysis right away. That nowadays, we do. There's a lot of paradigm shifts. So it's really hard for me to think of a clear-cut case. The one thing I still I can still think of is maybe an infant with anencephaly that is born and parents request certain life-sustaining interventions. And I would still strongly believe that we should not do anything of that sort and let him or he or she die peacefully. And just for my knowledge at anencephaly is a child that's born without a cerebellum is that correct it's been quite some time since i thought about that a cerebellum Cerebellum. yeah okay they still have a brain stem so they can still stimulate a breath but obviously it's they're essentially have no sense of consciousness they're comatose in a way so Mm -hmm. that's how they're born so yeah interesting the last kind of neonatology specific question i have for you is One of the things that we talk about in emergency medicine is advanced directives, and they are unfortunately not as useful to us as we would hope. So patients will come to the ED and they have no paperwork and they've come from home and you have to assume they want everything because it's very difficult to reverse death. You can take take an endotracheal tube out. You can't fix it if you chose not to intubate. And then the family comes in with the advanced directive and it says DNI. You're like, that's fun. Or they come in with an advanced directive that doesn't address the situation you're in. Is there anything similar in the world of neonatology? Since they're born and live in the hospital, I'm honestly just curious what Um, paperwork goes into this. Obviously, I am completely dependent on surrogate decision making since my patients are nonverbal. I wish they were sometimes. Yeah, that's sometimes I am, that's all I, I, we depend on. And you'll, and I always tell parents, even if it's the same scenario, like just different parents, I'll get a completely different answer. And that's why for me, that relationship building, the trust building with the parents for them to listen and trust my recommendations is really crucial. And at the same time, I always tell them, especially if it doesn't align with my own values or my team values, I really try to come into the room as a blank sheet who doesn't have any values and try to hear them out and tease out where they're coming from and see if it's ethically permissible. Like it makes sense. One, there's no doubt in my mind that they love their child and they want what's best for their for their uh, child. And at the end of the day, they will leave, live with this decision for the rest of their lives, not me. Uh, maybe I will think about this, but not like them. And, um, and that's all I do in my practice. It's being dependent on surrogate decision-making. I wish. Oh, <laughs> yes. How do you approach it if the parents disagree on the course of care? It Again, it really depends on where they're coming, why they disagree, like why what caused them to object to our recommendations and to make it even more complicated as maybe you have encountered is what if there's a disagreement not just between us and the parents but between the parents themselves Mm -hmm. and that gets tricky and we i it's it's an ongoing discussion it's just sometimes though we I'm not going to be like delusional and think of, and just, and I will never follow uh, parents' wishes if I know for sure that's not going to be beneficial and it's not going to reverse that child's medical condition that I will advise, consult the ethics committee. 
And honestly, when that happens, when the parents hear that I would like the advice and consult of the ethics committee, sometimes they take a pause and they say, oh, this is serious. Something mm -hmm. is and they are sometimes more open to discussion and understanding. Interesting. I wish we had the opportunity to consult the ethics committee more often than the ED. It's a resource that unfortunately is not generally available to us. All right, I'm going to take a little bit of a left turn and focus mm -hmm. more on care in the ED. And in preparation for this, I read a paper. It was Futile Care and Emergency Medicine Approach, Ethical and Legal Considerations by Dr. Jeremy Simon et al. We're not going to get too far into the legal considerations because I am not a lawyer and there's a hundred percent chance that I would say something that's not legally correct. So we're just not going to, just not going to touch that with the caveat that if the patient desires resuscitation, you should do what is legally appropriate in your state. One of the things they talk about in here that comes up a lot is this idea of goals of care and when does the physician have an ethical right to not perform a procedure? The American College of Emergency Physicians does have a, an ethical policy on this, which says physicians are under no ethical obligation to render treatments that they judge have no realistic likelihood of medical benefit to the patient. And a, a clear example of that I, I think illustrates it is if you have a trauma patient and that patient has blunt trauma to the chest and they've been receiving CPR from EMS for more than 10 minutes, essentially the majority of emergency physicians would agree you can discontinue CPR on arrival to the ED. There is no realistic chance that this patient is going to survive. But more often, we get these complicated cases. So I'm going to give an example case. This is from the paper, so it is not a real person. Let's take Ralph. Ralph is a 78-year-old man with advanced dementia, comes in with respiratory distress from pneumonia. He can't care for himself. He's been in the nursing home for a year. He does not speak. He does not recognize family. He does not seem aware of his surroundings. Comes in hypotensive, in septic shock, and with to have any chance of survival is going to need a central line intubation and aggressive treatment transfer to the ICU. Mm -hmm. You call the daughter, and she wants everything done for her father. This is a very familiar case to a lot of emergency physicians. In a case like this, who gets who would you say gets to decide what is non beneficial care? Because I think most physicians of any specialty looking at this case would say, "Hey, I don't think." Aggressive invasive treatments are necessarily the right option here, but if the daughter wants it, are we obligated to go forward? So this is, I think, again, whew, adult medicine. Been a while. <laughs> sorry, sorry to throw a seventy-eight year old at you. <laughs> no, this is seventy-eight good. day old coming back like a little baby. <laughs> I honestly, just by the the case you described to me, I recognize and sympathize about the fact that this guy is demented and probably has no aware of his surroundings, but he does make an impact to his surroundings, to his family, and let's say his daughter as well. And if, and we are also from a clinical standpoint, we're handling with a sepsis, which is potentially a reversible condition that can be resolved. And then at the end of the day, I mean, if his ICU admission is otherwise uncomplicated, meaning he's extubatable, he is in the meantime not getting any pneumonia or admission complications, he can go home, yet still demented, but yet we don't know him as much as his daughter does, and he she can tell us, you know what, he might be not aware, but five or 10 minutes a day, I get to see my dad back. He's more of himself. And that's, that makes everything that tells me everything that's so important to me. And I respect that. I really do. So I, again, as a non-adult physician who doesn't encounter that, I would not see any ethical challenge in that. Yeah. Good and and the, the authors of the paper agree with you. They right. talk a lot about how we are, we as physicians can have our own opinions, but in general, ethicists would agree that in this case, that the benefits are clear. There are benefits. It's a reversible, treatable disease, right. and you would be obligated to respect the family wishes. Um, one thing they brought up that actually calls back to what you were talking about earlier is talking to the daughter about what her expectations from the resuscitation are. And they bring up the possibility that we might be making assumptions about the daughter's goals 
it's possible that she understands that this is not likely to result in a, a long-term survival for the father, but she wants a chance to get the family together. And so you might never know that if you don't have that open communication in a non-judgmental fashion with the daughter. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, totally yeah. That's I think an area where I can often improve. I tend to make assumptions about what the family thinks is going to happen without actually ever asking them. And I, I also at fault with the same visceral feeling. And I always, I try to check myself if I do that. And that's like another thing that I tell myself and the team that we should never assume what the parents think, wish, or want. We need to hear that from them. Not only it will help the patient, but it will help us from a moral distress standpoint to maybe accept it better. Not necessarily agree, but accept it. Yep. And I think both of us are reliant on our primary care colleagues to to have some of these conversations in a less time limited fashion than we can manage in the emergency department. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You answered all the rest of my questions already. You skipped ahead and gave me some great answers. What other thoughts before before we wrap this up? What other thoughts do you have on end of life care and the, the, the difficult ethical decisions that we face? I think the whole futility thing, it's a huge ethical debate. We haven't touched one point where is also, I think it's relatable to both of us, uh, which is about soft code or ineffective code, partial CPR. There's a lot of debate on that as well, that if you ask physicians, you'll get a different answer about what they think. What do you think, Melissa? I have thoughts. I think it's unethical. You're either coding somebody or you're not. There's not an in-between there. And if you truly feel that there is no benefit, then you need to call the code. That said, certainly I know with pediatric patients, I have continued a resuscitation to allow time for the family to come, which I would consider different than a partial code. What are your thoughts? Very similar to what you just said. I, For me, it's when it comes to CPR, it's all or nothing. When I have a newborn, though, that is periviable, like extremely premature, if a parent asks me not to do chest compressions on this baby, I would respect that and just try intubation. Because again, from a clinical standpoint, CPR for adults and CPR for newborns are very different in terms of what matters more. For us, it's the airway, not so much the mm -hmm. heart. And once the airway is secured, in many cases, the heart is fine. I do feel like it's for me, it's appropriate. I understand where they're coming from with the actual compressions. It hurts them to see that. So I respect that. But if I have other scenarios, it's very hard for me to say I'm not, I'm only doing this, but not that. It's not standard of care for me. Yeah. It's we're either coding or we're not. Yeah. That's it. That's, there, that's been my approach. There are some, I don't know, in the literature, some pediatric ethicists who actually support ineffective uh, CPR. And I just, it, I can name a few, Dr. John Lantos, for example, or uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Trug from Harvard. They made really nice commentaries in many journals about that. And I have to say, no matter what kind of angle they give it, I just, I, I don't buy it. It's just, they really focus on the family benefit. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I just, I can't get over the fact that Yes, I care about the family, but I care more about the cold truth is I care more about the patient. Your primary ethical duty as a physician is to the patient, which in your case is a child. And in my yes. case is sometimes a child, but it is often an, an adult. Um, and that's yeah. Yeah. That's a, you know, I wanted to touch because that's also under the umbrella. of. Yes. And certainly, you know, we don't, so we don't do CPR on penetrating trauma anymore because there is no benefit to it. But it's not because we're not going to resuscitate the patient. It's because we've shown. It's probably the most controversial thing I've said. I'm going to get angry emails. But I don't see a benefit to CPR in penetrating trauma. The benefit is the chest tube and, and cutting open the chest and performing the procedures. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Saul, for, for coming on this podcast. This has been Critical Choices from the Ethics Committee of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine. We will be putting an episode out approximately every two months, and our next episode will be an interview with Wes Mondago, who will talk, be talking to us about 
potential roles for palliative care in the emergency department as a follow-on to this conversation about non-beneficial care at the end of life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Myers, for inviting me. It was a lot of fun.